You're no longer live, Raymond. Go live now. You're live recording. Now we're live. Wonderful. So, um, welcome to this session about uh, pivoting to face the pandemics. Um, we have a small but excellent panel today with um, Milivoje Batista uh, and Mathieu George. Uh, unfortunately, two other members couldn't uh, join today for medical and other reasons, uh, but I'm sure we can have a very interesting uh, chat today. Uh, some people may join later and ask some questions, uh, but um, as I'm based in Switzerland, I like to be punctual and start punctual also. Um, so what we will do now in the next uh, 45 minutes is um, I will start with a brief introduction of uh, each other. Um, then we'll introduce some major topics that are actually related to, let's say, the pandemics and how um, companies, organizations and countries are impacted by that and how they can react to that. Um, and we will then discuss each of the topics a bit in a kind of uh, interactive way, uh, listening to the contributions of each panel member from, let's say, his own organization, but also, also his own country. Um, and then we will end up with a kind of statement from each of the panelists, uh, kind of final remark, final statement. So this is the um, agenda for, for today. So let's start with the uh, introductions. Uh, so maybe, uh, Mathieu, can you introduce yourself, your background and what you're doing now? Um, and then also make a kind of statement about, let's say, the topic of uh, today. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much. So I'm uh, Mathieu Gorge. I'm the founder and CEO of VG Trust, which is a software as a service organization based in Dublin with offices in, in New York and, and Paris. Um, we uh, specialize in information governance and compliance. And um, I'm also the chair of the Global Advisory Board, which is a, a non-commercial think tank around security. Okay, great. Um, so next panel member, uh, Mili Voce Batista. So Mili Voce, can you introduce yourself also briefly? Um, my name is Mili Voce Batista. I'm the founder of Atomgate Network. It's a network of companies which are uh, placed in about 20 countries. <coughs> we are developing or uh, focusing on data protection and finding new ways of communication, social media, implementing new technologies like blockchain distributed ledger technologies and uh, packaging everything in a... We try to go a new way um, of communication and being together digitally and online. And our group is about, um, with all the members at the moment, about 25 to 30,000 people. And I'm as well based in Switzerland. And I'm very happy that, um, thankful you're having me today. Thank you yeah. for the invitation. Uh, so, about myself, um, I'm co-founder and CEO of a biotech company uh, called BioLingus. Um, so what we are doing uh, to, to make an example, if you know diabetes patients, many diabetes patients have to inject themselves for instance, with insulin on a daily basis. And so what BioLingus does, we have developed a small pill which you can put under the tongue so you don't need the injections anymore. And so we focus on, on uh, a few diabetes drugs, uh, but also obesity. Um, but of course, with biotech, meaning we still need uh, three, four years of development before we can launch uh, any product. Um, and so that's my uh, major, uh, let's say, um, role. Uh, aside from that, I'm also an advisor, board member in a number of uh, smaller biotech companies. Uh, for instance, I'm a senior advisor to a small biotech hedge fund in, in Switzerland. Um, I'm also uh, chairman of um, a company in Switzerland that uh, tries to make a matchmaking place for the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so because there's a lot of outsourcing in pharmaceutical industry and we try to do that in a digital uh, way. So these are some of the main things I do, but let's now uh, go to the topic of today. It's really about how 
does the pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic, influence what we do in our companies, in our countries? And so we will structure the discussion around three main topics. Uh, first of all, what is the influence of COVID and the pandemic on um, the people in the workforce uh, in general? So that's the first uh, topic. Uh, second topic is what's the influence on digitization uh, and digital economy? Yeah, there's a lot of things to be said about, and we have two more IT related uh, uh, panelists uh, here. Um, I think we lost Mathieu. Mathieu. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Yeah, yeah bad connection, probably. Okay, and then the third topic is the influence on the markets and the global economy, um, because there's also a lot of things uh, happening. Um, but let's wait a moment to get uh, Mathieu back. Yeah. I think it's... Uh... I think he lost his connection completely. So. Any suggestions as an IT? <laughs> I, that's, it's very difficult to say. It's, um, it's, um, what the reason is, you know, if the internet broke down. Or... At the moment, a lot of things happen, you know, this, uh, that there is all over the world cyber attacks. You don't know which center they're attacking at the moment what is happening. So it's like Ukraine has a huge impact at the moment all over Europe. Yeah. So it's difficult to say. I don't know what Matthew, uh, if he's able to enter, re-enter back or. So um, <clears throat> while we're waiting for um... Matthew, I, I still suggest we continue with some uh, uh, discussion. And maybe we can talk a bit about the first topic. It's, it's let's say, the post-COVID and the influence on the people and the workforce. I think the there are certainly changes happening. Uh, for instance, one is hybrid working. I mean, people are now used to partially working from home, partially. I, I have a hard time hearing you because something is really is scratching. And, um... Ah, OK. Um, now it's better. So people are partially working from home, partially uh, working in uh, um, the company itself. Uh, so they're getting more flexible. Some countries even um, started to introduce four day work week, like uh, my, my home country, Belgium, but also Iceland is experimenting with it, uh, UK. Uh, so what about that? And then we saw also in Germany, uh, the, the so-called Kurzarbeit. So we're actually uh, people are allowed to work less. Uh, the company has to pay them less, but then the government is compensating that with um, with, with their own money, actually, to, to support. So actually, everybody can keep work, working. And then a lot of things have been happening with, with e-learning in general. So uh, it, it would be good, uh, really, for you to have your um, comment on that. How what, what have you seen in your own company, which is also active in multiple... Uh, countries. Um, so what is your experience with it and how do you see it evolving in the future, actually? I mean, I, the, um, I mean, if we talk about the COVID and the pandemic, then, the, I mean, this accelerated a process which was already uh, ongoing and it just speeded up the process. Everybody started to develop faster and the direction was clear, you know, enabling people to work at any time, at any place under the new circumstances, which in my opinion led to a lot of good and new innovations, enabling people working, as I said already, wherever they want, because when people are able to work whenever and wherever they want, they're usually more, much more productive, which leads them to that point that four days are enough. If you four days working on the full steam under the circumstances uh, which fits best to your lifestyle and and is combinable with uh, with the requirements of your family and environment and everything, then um, um, how should I say? Uh, then four days is more than enough 
right to work you can be much more productive in four days than in five days or six days so you lead a big company actually did, did you change some some organizational structures or working ways in your own company actually no we did uh, honestly we did uh, we did not change we did work already before the pandemic like that the 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 only difficult environment for us was with the members and team members which for example are in india where where you have on the circumstance big families using one apartment together and then i mean the main participants in our in our structure are coders for them it was very hard to to find their space to concentrate on the work to code and to develop uh, when you have six seven other family members in the background just doing their daily life so th this was this was challenging and what was as well challenging um was the communication structured um under these circumstances when the people start to work whenever they were able to work right so some people usually you had like a certain time where everybody was meeting together and now some people started to work during the night and others in the morning and yeah. then the exchange so this was this was really challenging to find a flow and to keep the the quality of production up and delivering time mm -hmm. so this was really challenging for us yeah interesting Yeah, if I speak from my own experience, so I lead a small biotech company and we have offices in Switzerland, but also in Melbourne, Australia and in uh, Hong Kong. So we are used to work on different time zones. So we have been working virtual, but there's still some practical things that have to happen. And, and I mean, um, so if we do, if you have a biotech company, you need to do some lab work. And, and that's, of course, something that uh, will stay as it is otherwise you can't continue and i guess that's the same for any company if you're an it company it's probably easier to uh, go more virtual in a certain way i'm sorry it's a, it is indeed i mean i i can only imagine how it how it is for you in this environment because you, i don't know if you really can outsource that and let the people work at home we we are in the lucky position that we can do this but uh, it was it was very challenging the whole situation was very challenging okay. but the results of the developments today which came out of this challenging process are unbelievable so we created yeah. tools for our clients out of our learnings mm -hmm. that our clients yeah. are using today yeah. okay so so let's move to the next uh, topic emilia for you this is uh, this is becoming kind of fireside chat as they call it with with uh, you as the key interviewee um so let's let's talk about another very important topic um it, it's like the digital economy and digitization uh, in general so how did the um COVID pandemic influenced the digitization and digital economy. I mean, it, it's broad, of course. It, it's, let's say, it's a digital marketplace. It certainly have been booming during that period. It's digital currencies, cryptocurrencies. Um, but also aligned with that is the importance of security uh, of these systems, um, blockchain and so on, but also governance, like what's happening now in, in Ukraine raises questions about Should we govern, for instance, cryptocurrencies more at, at an international uh, level? So um, as, you, as you lead a large IT company, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Which changes have you seen in, let's say, um, your business uh, with regards to these aspects? I mean, the, the crypto industry, if you want, so the blockchain industry, there's a, a lot of young people and we could feel that this whole world, this instabilization, which is happening all over, um, brought the people really in a, in a corner. Some reacted with fear and some saw opportunities and, and chances to, to take. And we saw that people had much more time to, to use the digital environment and which was on, for the business, it was good, but in some private situation, especially when these groups created against whatever they thought is wrong, it doesn't matter if it's from the government or especially as well the, about the vaccinations and, and, and. So we saw that the people 
uh, reacted then as well by creating groups, uh, pushing themselves up, putting them up. And then we have a very big part, which is social media, and people start uh, promoting their hate speeches and all, all that. That was our biggest challenge to mm -hmm. keep that on the control. Yeah. You know, this was really challenging, yeah. that on the control. Yeah. If, if I see from my own experience how digitization has influenced, let's say, the, the biotech and pharma industry, Well, biotech and pharma is an industry where you really focus on, on your core competency and you outsource everything else. Yeah, Also, the, the lab work and so on, you try to outsource to specialists. But with the pandemic, then certainly it was hard to find these new partners. And the first six months, actually, uh, it, it was hard for us to find the right, the right parties. But then slowly, uh, people started, let's say, to having the, the normal live conferences started to become digital. And for us, it has been extremely effective. Uh, we have been able to do, let's say, partnerships with, with uh, many companies in this short uh, COVID time. And a bit weird, normally when you do a partnership, you meet the people, you look them in the eyes and so on. Uh, but we were, do, were able to do very good partnerships digital. So that has changed. And I'm also uh, the chairman of a, a small uh, marketplace called Biohub. And this is exactly what it is. So the idea is to create a marketplace for biotech and pharma companies uh, to outsource things. Um, so a bit like an Amazon, but for pharmaceutical projects, actually. Uh -huh. um, and so that has also gotten more traction because of this uh, this new COVID. I think people are not afraid of that anymore. So that's that's actually a very positive thing, I think. And uh, I see this kind of developments everywhere. It's really popping up like mushrooms in all industries. Yeah. And some industries like yours, the pharmaceutical industry is, uh, is a very complex structure to bring that under one head. But the interesting thing is when you, after, after a certain period, like five, six months to learn using more the digital environment, you create like your own dynamics of communication and uh, data and information exchange. And I find, found that very, very interesting and the, the The optimization process, which I saw, is like having people online, but for the right cause, right? Not being yeah. distracted yeah. because everybody is the whole day online and using yeah. still this social media environment. And uh, you don't want to be distracted, right? You can easily spend yeah. three hours in social media for nonsense. Right? Yeah. So this is this dynamics are very interesting yeah. to find out and optimize. Okay. This this was the. Yeah. Now, I have a question also related to this digitization. What, what about security in, in general? Because personally, I, I all, in, in my company, I've, I've seen a lot of people using, um, let's say, the COVID period where people couldn't travel to, to scam things. I saw a lot of, let's say, scam investors and other things coming up. So the security is becoming more important. How, how, how do you see that? What's your vision on that? Uh, in our environment, we are working with that and we have a strict policy. Was whenever it comes to somebody selling and somebody's buying, we're going by a strict KYC process, right? Because it, we call it trusted environment because everybody who you can participate if you just want to chat and whatever, but the moment yeah. you want to do business and then exchange values, in doesn't matter which form, then you have to be first identified. Still, these data and everything are press that they're they're safe yeah. on the site or not in the system but yeah. we had to do this because i mean people was impersonating other people yeah. and with cgi and all the technology available it could be that you talk with somebody from uh, from india impersonating uh, a swiss uh, investors group or or the other way around right so this is this is and this is still very difficult so this is a hard process yeah. Yeah, so so that means actually the digitization will bloom, but alongside with that, the security measures have to be, be enforced a lot. Yeah. Definitely, and for the most people, it's not a, it's not even about the money. So people always think, oh, the guys, the guys are coming in our network or trying to. I mean, of course, you have to ransom software. People are taking, shutting your system down, and then you have to pay and then give you the key to, to open up again. This is one aspect. The other aspect is industrial spionage. So to find out what they're working about. I mean, I can only imagine in your environment, uh, you spending millions to find processes and ways for application and and uh, 
um, workflows. And then people start attacking to find out to shortcut this process to reduce their costs. And this is behind this kind of attacks is usually a huge, um, very strong financially uh, supported criminal organizations. Yeah. Yeah. In some cases, even the government. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So let's move to the next topic, which is uh, what is the, has been the impact of, of COVID, let's say, on on the, the markets and the global economy. Yeah, if, if I look at it from my perspective, I see like diverging trends. There is a, like a deglobalization trend. Yeah, supply chains are more difficult, and that that's why people are trying to keep it more local or, or regional. There's a kind of my country first uh, feeling, which uh, unfortunately some countries express for. Um, with war these days, there is polarization in the world uh, between rich and poor countries, which is getting stronger. You see it also in, in who gets vaccinated and or, or not. Um, there's a polarization between digital haves and have-nots, um, uh, and which again leads to polarization in income. Um, but on the other hand, there's also some positive things. I think the, there's a kind of also a we the world feeling so people realize we have to work together as the whole world to work on sustainability to work on let's say the global pandemic so so these are diverging trends yeah so um what what did you see uh Milevoy, in, in in your world as in your company in, in the countries you work uh, I, I, I really don't like to say that uh, there was one point where coca-cola was very right when they said think global act local and uh, what we learned in this whole thing is that digitalization does not work in, in a global aspect. So you have to create the cells, make the cells work, make uh, uh, a way of communicating together, interpreting the data you're receiving and the information you're receiving. That's very important because what uh, you m might use the same words to explain to me something, but I come, I'm coming out of another industry and I'm interpreting these words and this information in a wrong way. And that destroys the, our whole workflow. So we had first to learn to interpret the way we are talking together. And this is, this was a, this yeah. was, I think the biggest surprise, right? That we just, that was not able, we didn't saw the possibility just to switch from, from the normal environment to a digital environment and go on like we used to do it before. So we had first to learn each other's language and that was that was a very important part and the other yeah. part was of course receiving and sending data handling data we found out that a lot of these data um, uh, are collected absolutely useless because it's just filling up in on the servers and if you don't have the, the, the right interpretation of it then you cannot even work so you go back to to kindergarten school and building up small steps uh, putting that together and they say, oh, that, that works now, it's awesome. And then you're building up on that. And you, your partner in the other countries have to do the same. But if one of them is not doing the same, then the whole production, the supply chain, nothing really works. And that's what we see today. I mean, when you, when you look in Australia, I mean, Australia, the shelves are empty, you know, for food, for many products. And as it started as well now in Europe. It's the same thing that it's not that these products are not available. It's just under these new circumstances, we are not able to keep the supply chain up and the time frames. I still get my product from A to B and to the final consumer, but it takes me much more time. And that was like a reverse effect on, on what is happening now with this whole pandemic. We were not prepared to... Uh, to handle this and the big even the big companies who have a lot of money available we see this we see this in our daily business right are not able to deliver in time because of this communication like they use the, the computers are doing everything but now we are all together in on the screen and working together and we are not able to communicate what what uh, is required to keep them yeah. oh, Matthew is back Hi. Yeah, Matthew, Hi. Yeah. Matthew, we're discussing, let's say, the influence of COVID on markets and global economy, let's say, diverging trends. And, and Milovoy was just explaining uh, what he has seen in his company in terms of uh, supply chain disruption, which was uh, actually there. And I can also speak from our small company. I said, like, even if you're small, you act global. That means 
some parts of our process are done in US, others are done in Europe, others are done in Asia. And I did see we, we, we work with uh, very expensive materials and that we had to ship them and that it got very difficult, you know, that, that uh, uh, during the past two years. So, so even we have seen it. But because we are very specialized, let's say localization is, is not possible. Some, some of the processes can only be done at one place, at one company in the United States. Or, or, so we cannot just say, oh, well, let's do it now in, in Switzerland or so, because it doesn't happen here. Um, so while you're back, Mathieu, maybe what are the trends that you have seen that have been most uh, strong in terms of, let's say, um, deglobalization or disruption of the um, supply chain or polarization in the world? Um, so can you speak a bit to that? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, my apologies for technical problems. Um, but that actually is one of the things that happens with remote working and, and productivity and everything. So um, uh, from from my perspective, I, I think that um, uh, obviously the, the disruption of supply chain is something that all of our clients and all, all of the members of our advisory boards are, are seeing. Um, it's also one thing that not everyone realized they were dependent on. Um, you know, there's always that thing that every country tries to put their, their own production first, and that makes sense. But the reality is that in today's world, we can't, we can't just work on our own. Like, no single country can do that. Um, and uh, if we go back to a model where we try to do this, I don't, first of all, I don't think we'll manage. But second, I, I, I do think that it will... Um, it, it will further disrupt the quality and uh, the innovation that we that we're able to do when when we collaborate all of us and so um from a polarization perspective which is the other point that you mentioned i think that um the uh, covid has uh, impacted the, the the generic wealth uh, and purchasing purchasing power of of a lot of people, and of course the rich got richer and the poor got poorer, but the mid market got a bit more effective. I think they um, you know they started looking at how can I change my life to spend less money on fuel because now I don't have to drive to work. Um, how can I uh, look at how I spend my money because I can't go to a restaurant, I can't go to a club, I can't go to a shop. I, I'm going to get the same amount of money. What am I going to do with it? And so we've seen kind of a, a different way of, of thinking around that. Um, I, I think that in, in, in the context of my area of expertise in cybersecurity and critical infra infrastructure protection, um, we we've seen people understanding that their ecosystem changes all the time right so um uh, whereas up up until 2020 everybody thought well we've got our systems and maybe we grow maybe we shrink but generally speaking we we understand where our data might be we understand where uh, the risks might be suddenly at the very same time, in and around the, the 16th of March, 2020, every company, whether small, micro, or large, or super large, had the same problem that their risk surface exploded. And so um, I, I, I think that to some extent, COVID has provided on that front some opportunities to, to get our houses in order, right? So trying to understand how we do business, trying to remove the services we don't need, trying to add the services that we that we need. Um, I'll give you an example. From a VG Trust perspective, we now have people working from home. Uh, we have a very international um, uh, staff, and some of them went back to their home countries to work, right? Some of them went back to Brazil, to uh, the Caribbean, uh, to, to France, and so on. And, and we actually find that, ironically enough, we've been a lot more productive working away from each other than we were before. And so um, the, the, the productivity is something that we probably need to discuss from a COVID impact perspective. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we, we discussed that a bit uh, before, but Milo Voya, but I asked you the question also. We, we, 
touched the subject of uh, of productivity and also Milovoyer was saying in his company he has also seen with the uh, the remote working that actually people got more productive yeah and and so uh, in line with that what what would your view be on for instance like a four day week where people work four days of let's say 10 hours instead of five of eight hours yeah i so i, I you know again from a, a vg12 perspective we we we've, we've never worked as well together and we we have been extremely flexible so we have staff that have very young kids and they work from like 6 to 7, 6 a.m. to 7.30. Then they look after the kids. They come back for meetings between 11 and, and 3 p.m. They disappear for two hours again and they do another two hours. And the flexibility is, is something that we've really tried to put in place. You also have to remember that as a, as a company leader, as you well know, um, you have to look after the well-being of your employees, right? And so they're affected by COVID. And of course, you are also affected by COVID, but you have a duty to make sure that you kind of minimize the impact on them. And if, if it involves restructuring the way you do work, the flexible hours, the number of hours, how you manage performance, I think it's a great opportunity to do it. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about the great resignation, people leaving jobs because they're like, you know what, there's the pandemic, who knows what's going to come next, I want to do what I like to do, and, you know, that you can see that point. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think that there's a great reset somewhere where some people don't want to leave what they're doing, they just want to do it differently in a mm -hmm. way that it, it makes their life a little bit easier. Um, in, in a safer way and in a way that, that allows them to um, essentially uh, make sure that they provide the right environment for their staff to do better. Yeah, exactly. That's also one of the reasons that in Belgium they want to switch to the four-day work week was to for the people to have more like a, a better work-life balance. Yeah, um, And that's one of the reasons. Another was just... Uh, to, to reduce traffic jams. One of the good things of COVID, as people didn't move, uh, commute to the work, there were less traffic jams. And so now, by, by if the people work four days a week, they will go to work earlier in the morning, come back later, and in general, the traffic will be more spread, but that's another thing. Uh, it's, it's also kind of learning from the COVID period. So it's partially for the well-being of the people, but partially also for beneficial things for the country. Now, I want to, Mathieu, come back to another thing as you lead a security uh, company. Um, so we have spoken before about, let's say, the blooming of, for instance, digital marketplaces and, and digitization in general. But what we have seen also is alongside with that, because people didn't interact with each other. Uh, for instance, partnerships were done with people you never met. So the security becomes more and more important. Uh, because if, if you never meet each other and work virtual all the time and, and rely on digital processes, the chance for security being breached becomes higher also. So, so how do you see that trend, uh, Mathieu, and, and what trends do you see for the future? So I, I think that we need to recognize that um, there were a lot of companies that wanted to digitize their services and their products before the pandemic. But the experience I had was that they were saying, you know, it's going to take us three years or five years to do it the right way. We have to wait. We have to plan it. Mm -hmm. And what actually happened in practice is that um, between March and, and May 2020, people just um, tried to understand what was going on. And then from June onwards, everybody wanted to digitize as fast as possible. And there was a very good reason for that. It was about survival of the business and uh, being able to reach people who com could no longer physically come to your, your outlet to buy stuff. Uh, unfortunately, that was done at the expense of compliance and security. And, and again, you, you can understand the, the rationale behind it because as a, as a business owner, well, your, your job is to stay in business, to generate profits for shareholders, 
and to um, to make sure that you uh, you you, uh, you you increase the business and you increase the sales. Mm-hmm. So if that involves taking a risk on compliance and security, and you you've no way of knowing whether the pandemic is going to be one year, two years, five years, or ten years. Well, you're just going to go for it. But the challenge with that is that once you're up and running and people start buying online and you have to ship everything, you get a supply chain issue, go back to the supply chain. You get uh, an issue with uh, managing the data, with uh, making sure that you can still provide the right level of customer service. And so I think that um, a lot of organizations today are going back to what they did in the last 18 months and talking to security people and saying, okay, uh, we are going to stay in business. We are going to prevail. Uh, what do we need to do now to make sure that we don't fall down because of security and compliance? And I, I, and I, I, I suspect you'll agree with me that we've seen a huge rise in ransomware and in scams mm-hmm. and in fraud yeah. during yeah. COVID. Uh, fraud yeah, we, we were talking about that. Yeah. I have seen it myself also. A lot of scam investors coming to me promising big things, uh, but clearly scam. And some were some were sophisticated and some were not. But I have seen uh, many things. Yeah. Uh, I, I, absolutely. Um, and so um, it, it's it's kind of interesting that um, you 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 can see that our risk surface is is much bigger than it was because we've got people working from home some with company devices, some with their own devices. And now that we can, you know, organizations are asking people to bring their their personal devices back to the office so that the data can be extracted and uh, or that the, 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 the personal device can be secured. And it's great. But in the meantime, we have that void of about 18 to 24 months of data that is not rogue, but is not controlled. And it's it's a it's a major security challenge right now. So it's good times for your security business then. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's good it's good time for the security business, uh, and unfortunately, it's a, you know right now with all of the the cyber attacks, the disinformation, the doom scrolling, the TikTok war. Um, it, it's it's even busier than ever. Um, mm-hmm. I but I do believe that you know the, the the good news is that it's not rocket science to secure uh, even a large environment. You just need to manage your ecosystem. We just need to regain control of that new ecosystem, and then make the most of it because it's here to stay. We're not all going to go back to the office. I I doubt it. Right. Okay, Mille, for you, do you have any comments on this, on the security part of this? No, I, I'm, I fully agree with Mathieu. I, I was just uh, laughing because it, it was the same, the same flow I had, uh, yeah. which he brought up. So it just confirms my point of view. Okay, great. So um, I suggest in the last five minutes now is that we just um, yeah, ask each other maybe to for some for some final comments. Uh, on this final insights or conclusions that you want to share with with uh, uh, the audience for the future, also. So maybe Milivoje, any thoughts? I mean, for the future, I'm, I'm. I see the future really bright. I see a lot of opportunities. I see a lot of possibilities. We have to take the learnings out of this. Uh, uncomfortable situation we had the last two years and take them over and optimize the processes and the only thing i want to give the audience on on it don't wait to increase your security budgets until until something happened do it before because after that it's going to be much much more expensive okay yeah good um Mathieu, any any closing remarks ideas for the future yeah, I, I do think that we need to uh, embrace this opportunity to look to uh, a brighter future where we have uh, more times with our families and with our friends and we can um, work in a smarter way and, 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 and essentially make the most of the new possibilities of, of, of that post-pandemic way of working. And also, I think we should learn from the fact that we've 
it was very uncomfortable. Unfortunately, it was very sad for a lot of people. But as, as, a, as a global community, we prevailed and we need to learn from what we did right and what we did wrong so that we can actually embrace that bright future that you guys were talking about. Yeah. Okay, with this, I cannot do anything else, but thank you, uh, Mathieu and Mille Folce for this uh, excellent discussion. Very good insights in the uh, uh, discussion about specific topics and the influence of uh, COVID and how it will stay. But ultimately a hopeful message. And so that's a good way uh, to conclude. Uh, so thank you very much to small, but uh, excellent panel today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.